Hello and welcome to Westeros the Rogue's coverage of Season 4 of Game of Thrones. We're going to be doing a similar format to the previous years in that we will be covering some background material and filling in some of the bits that the show leaves out and also covering our highs and lows for each episode. But instead of doing it separately, we're going to be both sitting here and talking to each other basically and making it a little more interactive for you. And uh, we're going to be starting today then with the first episode, Two Swords. So in Two Swords, there's there's a lot of little bits that we could discuss about the um, the reforging of Valyrian steel and what goes into that. Um, but I think a topic near and dear to my heart is the King's Guard, and in this uh, episode we see the well the chamber of the of the of the King's Guard, and the, the White Sword Tower is what it's called in the the books. It's a special tower where the brothers are, or the the King's Guard are quartered. And they have this white book, the the book of the white book of the brothers, which basically every single king's guard who ever served has an entry. It shows his arms of his family. It says provides some biographical information, then fills up all his deeds from you know from the time he you know first came to renown, all the way through to when his time in the king's guard ended. Well, generally, generally by his death, uh, it's a really fantastic thing to see it there. Um, and you know one of the things that we've always praised is how much work they put into props like this. Um, in the first season, the genealogy book had actual entries written by Brian Cogman, and it was great to see some actual material uh, in this one. Uh, best of all, of course, was you know for me personally was seeing Sir Arthur Dane being discussed. <laughs> yes, you'd like a copy of that page, I think. Yeah, um, Sir Arthur Dane, the Sword of the Morning, the uh, a Dornish knight of great renown, uh, considered the deadliest of Aerys' King's Guard. George R. R. Martin has said that if he, uh, at his prime, and Barristan Selmy, who was his fellow sworn brother, at his prime came to blows, uh, it would be a toss-up, unless Dane had the ancestral sword Dawn in his hands, and then it would kind of go his way. Um, a figure full of sh this image of chivalry, like he, he was the pinnacle of chivalry, um, to many characters, including Jamie Lannister. Jamie Lannister wanted to become him, um, in a way. Uh, Sarfer actually knighted him. It's not something that's mentioned, but um, it is in the books mentioned. But uh, following the King's Good Brotherhood expedition, which is Sarfer... also mentioned yeah. in this scene, they actually uh, speak about uh, how he defeated the. The smiling knight of the Kingswood Brotherhood and led the attack of the, the Kingswood Kingswood Brotherhood, Brotherhood and defeated the, the smiling knight. Yeah. So that's one of the things that Joffrey points out as the great deeds of uh, Arthur Dane when he's going over his entry. Yeah. And obviously, in the books, when this is all from the book, I mean, uh, Jamie was a part of that. That's not actually yeah. mentioned. Jamie was, as a, as a squire, was part of this expedition, um, helped save the life of uh, Lord Craycall, who he was serving, and actually traded blows with the smiling knight, who was one of the leaders. This sort of madman knight to sort of uh, this mad jumble of you know violence and, and chivalry came to blows for a bit until uh, Sir Arthur came in and sort of took over the fighting and uh, his description of it is you know Dane and and the smiling knight fought and you know Dawn was cutting ch chunks out of you know destroying basically um, the smiling knight sword and the smiling knight. I guess we should say, for those who don't remember, Dawn is it's not Valyrian steel, but it is made of some special meteorite iron or something like that. So it is a special sword. It's an you know, ancient sword. Ancient sword, pale like milk glass is how it's described, and it, it's so it's it's a uh, like Valyrian steel in its properties that it is much sharper and it's much hardier than regular steel. Its origins are lost in the mists of legend. I have theories. There's a video somewhere yeah. on our site discussing that one. But uh, and he's thinking of it and how you know the Smiling Knight says you know it's basically uh, Dane lets the Smiling Knight get a new sword because he kind of destroyed his knight and well it's. And that's why I tell them, you know, it's, it's your sword I, I really want. And as they get set to fight again, you know, then you shall have it, sir, was Dane's response. And he killed the Smiling Knight. Um, so so Jamie thinks in this very section where he's looking yeah. at the book and the entry. It's a, it's a reworked scene, obviously. It's a very internal scene in the books. It's all basically Jamie thinking about these entries, reading them and thinking about him in the context of his present situation and all of that. 
So they reworked the material into a scene that actually has some dialogue and they introduced Joffrey into the scene and all of yeah. this and used the material, but we did lose a very beautiful line. Yeah, which is, you know, that he, he had dreamed of becoming the Sword of the Morning and ended Somewhere up... Somewhere along the way, way he ended up the Smiling Knight instead. It's yeah, a... it's a fantastic. But it, the other thing is obviously, and when Joffrey points out how short Jamie's entry is, and it's a funny thing, obviously, Jamie has done some things to merit mentions uh he's won some tournaments and so on and he kind of complains that his father's barris and selmy the lord commander is in charge of writing it barris and selmy could have written about some of that but selmy's distaste for jamie led him to kind of scant jamie a bit but then jamie thinks you know but i really don't have much that is worth putting in there in retrospect uh, you know he became the smiling knight he wasn't uh, sort of, you know, the sort of the morning and and now the big thing is where he thinks and i love that line as well that he thinks you know it's time for him to start writing, you know, he, it, yeah. it's, it's for him to write um, the rest of his story. And it's, it's sort of, it's a really interesting little bit because it's... It sets the tone for him sort of starting yeah. to take charge of his own destiny to some or trying yeah. to control to, to, to accept some of the blame for uh, some of the things he did, um, the responsibility, not really, and, and this saying, okay, I did those things and now I have the, my future ahead of me and I'm going to try and do the right thing. So um, it's a it's a great scene. It's a great scene on show, and it's it was really lovely that they have it. It's you just lose some of the the atmosphere and some of the characterization entailed. I would also love this a passing mention of you know Barristan Selmy's page, which would have been you know quite long. He, Especially since the next scene actually cuts to Danny. Yeah, yeah. it would have been terrific so to sort of have Barristan uh, kind of yeah. presage that way. But um, but that that's the background of the White Book and what it means and and what it means to Jamie. That he's in there, but doesn't have a lot of of history recorded. That's that's worth mentioning, and and what it means to, for the future for him. Now about highs and lows for this episode. Well, we've already mentioned that we quite like this scene, but um, our very favorite scene is probably one where the stars are <laughs> entirely digital. It is the scene with. Uh, well, not entirely, because obviously you've got uh, uh, Daenerys in the scene as well, but uh, the dragons, the scene with Danny and her three dragons, and where we get a taste of how wild they are starting to become, and also just seeing the absolutely fantastic effects. I mean, I mean the visual stunning. effects are uh, mind-blowing for what can be done on television. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would love to talk to the, the VFX people and find out a bit, like, how many, you know, polygons or you know what they had in, that, in those models because I just think back to 1990 something when Jurassic Park came out and how <laughs> how amazing it was and I'm pretty yeah. sure these dragons are probably more detailed than that T-Rex ever yeah. was and it's just and this is on a television show a television budget at but HBO television budget, but still, it's still television. Yeah. And she's sitting there with a dragon head in her lap Lap and, and scratching his head and... Uh, the wind as he takes off. Yes. And, you know, it just, that's obviously well-timed, obviously, with a wind machine, whatever. But yeah. it's, just, it's just amazing. It's really and I mean, well done. I, I can't... It's quite convincing. You, you yeah. kind of want to know where you can get one of those. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I keep thinking, I mean, there's... There's a lot to talk about the show, and it's it's a ma it, one of the things you have to remember is it's a massive endeavor. There are hundreds of people, literally hundreds of people, working on it, both during production and after production. And as I think it's probably in terms of production value, yeah. the absolutely you know most ambitious television shows that's ever been done. Short, the yeah. only one that can really top it, I think, is is HBO's own Rome, which was substantially more expensive but that expense was not necessarily just because the production values it was because they were filming in one of the most expensive places in the world to actually film in in italy and yeah. in in rome yeah. proper i think uh, so I mean, there's a lot of romans actually there that you from italians that you actually have to move out of the way and coordinate so that obviously them. was a quite yeah. a high expense uh, but i think so a lot of that rome budget you can't say every single penny's on the screen because no. a lot of it ended up logistics, I guess. Is the logistics, yeah. whereas a lot of the money is ending up on the screen for for this yeah. one. The logistics is, I think, um, the crew in Northern Ireland, all the people working post production around the world. And I mean, literally, it's around the world. There's people in 
in California, there's people in, I think, Germany and all over the world, basically, working on this thing. Um, it's an amazing feat. It is absolutely an amazing feat. I can, I, you know, I may, I may wish things... We may wish things look differently, yeah. but they design costumes differently, but they yeah. design castles differently. I mean, what they do, they do well. It's just that sometimes that you want, you wish that, well, if they can do it so well, why aren't they... Why not go be extra mile yeah, and get or it? Or not just extra mile, why not just stay closer to what was actually described, for example, yeah, or, when you can do it so well anyway. Yeah. So, but that's it. But yeah. it's just as, as a feat, I mean, it's an amazing production. I yeah. can't take anything away from it. On that score and i really expect we're going to see many more amazing things this season uh, visuals and, and sort of set pieces action it's looking uh, like a very big season um but it's not just production value uh, no. there's lots of other things and there are good scenes in this episode um i enjoyed the, the jamie tywin scene yeah i i liked um i personally liked the characterization Okay, of the int- of the of Uber Martell, I I like Pedro's yeah. performance particularly. I, I mean, as we we're not quite happy with the fact that they decided that they had to move the actual introduction largely from sort of being outside of King's Landing and Tyrion meeting the Dornishmen as they ride up. Um, first of all, that scene did have some missed opportunities in that. Why are all the Dornish Dornish men? Here they have a chance to show that uh, you could have had Dornish ladies. You could have ha- you could have ha- had it be a Dornish lady who spoke in, in, to Tyrion instead. Yeah, in fact, I think that actor it, is actually listed as uh, was as Lord Blackmont. Blackmont. Who is Lady Blackmont it, in the books? It would have been wonderful yeah. to have a woman just riding up at the head of this group and being the yeah. spokesperson, and you're like, wow, that wouldn't happen anywhere else in Westeros. No, Wales. so so that that's just an odd missed opportunity, yeah. and then. Unfortunately, seems they wanted to use their favorite set, perhaps their most expensive set, namely Littlefinger's brothel. Um, they just had to squeeze people in there again. I mean, not that there's absolute, there's nothing wrong with Oberyn being in a brothel. He quite likes his brothels, but yeah. but yeah. why the scene had to be set there and why we needed. More random naked extras. Well, SNL, you know, Saturday Night Live answered out with the executive producer for Tits. So yes, he's clearly been doing his job for the first episode. Yeah, but all that said, I mean, I a lot part of the change is obviously a lot of the details that you get when Tyrion first sees Oberyn and realizes Oberyn is not Doran. They're well. all in his head. It's on his head, yeah. and you can't really so by showing him in action. True. It obviously does very quickly characterize him. Yes. You don't get fully... I mean, you just have Tyrion's line where he's such an illustrious warrior. You don't really know no, no. Uh, the full range of what he's done. Yeah. But as a quick sketch, as a quick... No. Here's a couple of things to keep in mind about this character. He's, you know, that the Dornish men you know, are the sexiest people around. <laughs> uh, that they can be very hot-tempered. Yeah. That... They're very capable when it comes to violence. Um, they're dangerous. I mean, they're dangerous. That that's that fits yeah. pretty well. I mean, and obviously, you know, I have a visual quibble, but that's just me. I just it's just so silly. Why again do they have to go and like put facial hair on a character <laughs> who doesn't have? I mean, we, the actor decided to grow the facial hair. He didn't have it when he was cast, and it's like, yeah, why? If well, his ha- choice, what he said was that he, I don't recall if he said it was his decision or if they asked him. What he did say is he has rather patchy facial hair. Yeah. So, but, so it's like, not like no, a natural no, move. Oh, yeah, I wear this all the time. Yeah. No. And, and, you know, like also the Dornishmen are supposed to wear their hair longer than the rest of Western. True. So they could have set them apart like that as well. They, they yeah. put wigs on other people. It's just those little things that I, you know, wish they did to bring the characters more alive. And... And I have reservations about um, the way they're deciding to characterize Alaria. I have to say that I there's not a lot no. here. She's, she's no, a, there's some of the previews that we've seen and, as well. I, yes, uh, in private, I I can buy it. I think that um, they they may be playing her up in a way that I certainly don't expect from what we see. From the little bit that we have in the book, don't seem to quite characterize her like that. Yeah, I could see that argument. Uh, 
Uh, I have more of a wolf what we've seen in the later of some of the costuming. But the costume here in the first, yeah. other than the fact that in thinking Tails are sort of broad and it's like, that's not, yeah. like, that's not very period. Yeah, the, the Dornish costuming is looking quite fine. I like, I like his robe. I like it his robes quite a lot. could be even more colourful, there could be some stripes, but it's, it, at least yeah. we got robes, so I'm very grateful yeah. for that. No, no. <laughs> um, and I think we that's sort of one thing, and then what would we want to say is another? Was there anything else that really stuck out? There, there were some little fillers let's go, let's go. that were kind there, of. There were some couple silly I, and annoying sort the, of. Marjorie and Elena scene with Elena sending out the girls to find jewelry. Find jewelry. I don't know, and I think and I then the Brienne scene. Going anywhere, but it seemed pointless. Yeah, and then the Brienne scene afterward. That yeah. one. Um, Brienne unfortunately didn't get great material in this. It gave the. I think it feels like a scene that should have gone longer, and maybe it was originally longer yeah. than they cut it. I mean, this is a long episode; it's fifty-eight yeah. minutes, I think. So they might have had to trim it, and that was one of the things that fell off. Yeah. But it it did feel a little bit like. It'd be nice to have Marjorie and Brienne meet again. Yeah. Okay, and I can understand that, but I sometimes you don't have to show certain things. No, and I mean, and then also her scene with Jamie. Standing there and looking down on Sansa and talking about, well, you should be protecting Sansa. All of this, of course, are complications introduced by the fact that they are in King's Landing at a much earlier point in the story. And I don't know if it's just knowing that this is not how it played out or if these scenes, because they feel somehow awkward and like the characters wouldn't really act like this at this point in time. I I I would say that for me personally it's it's an awkward scene, literally just the staging of it. Like yeah. they just happen to wander by or did they decide to stalk Sansa? <laughs> I'm not quite sure what the idea is. It's sort of it's a it's a very convenient little scene to bring up a point they want to make, which is Jamie kind of backsliding on his promises yeah. and deciding that he doesn't want to, you know, he doesn't he he's sort of thinking i don't want to bother uh doing this stuff like i said it and i thought it like i should do it yeah. but now i don't feel like it and i don't have a massive problem with that as such he's he's just got him back he's gotten cleaned up he's feeling physically far better than he has in a long time he's gotten this amazing sword yeah. it's which he doesn't really have much use for but well, well, he doesn't know that yet entirely. I mean, he knows he's no good with the left, but yeah. if Corrin Halfhand can learn to fight like a demon with the left hand, why can't Jamie Lannister? Yeah. That said, I can see the sort of... He, he, he's getting comfortable with the status quo, and he's kind of thinking, like, do I really have to? And I hope... There's not something that they keep on too long. I think I hope yeah. that they sort of go back towards a Jamie who looks at that mostly empty page and thinks, you know, I've got, I have a chance to put stuff down here that's actually worth something, that actually says something, that, that actually shows that I did have honor. Um, and I hope they, they bring that around. But uh, otherwise, you know, I have to say all, on the whole, the episode really did have very little in the way of fat. It was a pretty, it was yeah. a fairly brisk episode given that it's the first episode the first yeah. episode always happens because you're kind of reintroducing yeah. things and they've definitely improved from like the second season opener was if you look back at the review it was a tough one for them because they kind of went and said we are going to catch up every single storyline everyone including yeah. introducing Stannis for the first time yeah. and it was too much in too little time. Obviously, we do have two introductions here. We have the Dornish, and then we have uh, sure. the Fens being introduced into the Wildling storyline. And sure, but there's there's, but there's a general feeling yeah. that they've been able to compress it and contain yeah. it in a lot uh, in a much better way. Uh, John is there, but it's relatively brief. It's good stuff mm. too, though, actually. And um, uh, Theon and Ramsay. I mean, uh, Roose Bolton, if we're going to see the phrase again, all that has been sort of left aside for now, which is, I think, the, the right choice. Uh, so on the whole, other than the, the Elena and Marjorie stuff and a couple of quibbles, it, it, it's a solid episode, I think. It's not, it's not that spectacular, but the first episode 
I mean, other than like when you first yeah. saw the. I mean, it was a good choice to put the the dragon scene in there because it gives it a wow moment. It's hard because it, it yeah. is the wild, one um, wow moment you really have. And it has um, the the actual opening certainly looks spectacular as well with the reforging of the sword, even if it's you know anyone who knows anything about forging <laughs> swords uh, probably mm. thinks it's pretty laughable because you don't just melt the steel and pour it into a form no i mean and, that's that's uh, probably how you would do it with like bronze or something right yeah you cast bronze. Well, obviously as we realized as we were preparing this it is most likely a homage to the opening of uh, conan conan uh, the barbarian the, yeah. to john millius and as a polidorus theme and yeah. i was re-watching it and it's like uh linda pointed out even when we were kind of watching them side by side that uh, this new take on the um, the Reigns of Castamere yes, theme. They add a bit of extra drums in the background, which yeah. I think also is echoing the... Uh, Battle of Yeah. Sound. I That was really clever. I, I did like that. I mean, I, I don't have a problem with, like, it's implausible, this vision yeah. of this pouring out <laughs> steel in a cast. It doesn't... It doesn't... You don't really do it that way. Yeah. But it's it's a great visual. Yeah. And I, I, I am a sucker for homages, for references to other works. Yeah. And... Um, it's too bad, I think, though, that they actually have Tywin not tell Jamie that it uh, yeah. uh, came from, or the swords were made from ice. Because... I don't think we needed him to say it, but it would have been nice to have Jamie... Yeah, at from least what, show understanding. Ref- yeah, reflect on yeah. this. like like when... I, I was thinking of a scene with, when Tyrion is told that it's Oberyn who's come, and Dinklage has such a perfect kind of... Kind of, he's this yeah. kind of... His, his, he blanks and like, <laughs> oh... And you know that in his head... Everything is falling into place, and he's thinking of all this stuff about who, like in a split second, who Oberyn is and what it means yeah. that he's here. Uh, that mo- so it would have been lovely to have Jamie have a moment like that. Actually, I would have liked that. But yeah. otherwise, I mean, it's it's a great scene, and I, yeah. and I think most, I hope, I hope most people will remember or at least figure out when that wolf for you know wolfskin scabbard is written, yeah. but they know what it yeah. means, like what that was. <sighs> to be honest, I think a lot of people may actually end up missing it, but it's it's a wolf, Stark. They're gonna yeah. get it. So on the whole, solid episode. It's not knock your socks off, but it's the, when other than the very first episode of a series, like the very first when we yeah. first saw it. Yeah. You know how can there's never been the first episode that's really knocked anyone's off. off. No, true. Um, so. Not not for Game of Thrones at least. Other yeah. shows can can do it, but not Game of Thrones so far. But yeah. uh, it, it's a solid start, and I I think they have learned a lot from the missteps they made in previous first episodes. Um, and they, they've kept it pretty well balanced. It's mm-hmm. it, it, it's solid. It's a good episode. So um, we'll, I guess, see everyone next week then. When yeah, we discuss... we'll be back for George's episode. Yeah, The Lion and the Rose.